Hello, Sublation Media viewers, listeners, and readers. It's me again, Douglas Lane. On January 2nd of 2023, a writer named Gabriel Rockhill published an essay in Counterpunch that was entitled Capitalism's Court Jester, Slavoj Zizek. And this video will be a response to that essay. I've read on the front of your books it's quoted that you're the most dangerous philosopher in the West. You don't seem very dangerous to me. Here I must disappoint you, you know. I am this type of a joker guy. I mean joker from Batman, you know. Yeah, I know. I laugh and so on, but I can be a Stalinist when I... If you give me power, I know how to use it. That's why I'm afraid almost of myself. I don't want power. Slavoj's success has made him a frequent target on the left. Other than the analytic philosopher and linguist Noam Chomsky, Zizek is perhaps the most famous radical in the world. In fact, the distinction between Chomsky and Zizek helps to explain why Zizek is so often attacked. Unlike Chomsky, Zizek represents the continental philosophical tradition, and this means he is misunderstood and therefore dismissed by the segment of the left in America that has been influenced most by Chomsky. If you ask Chomsky's closest allies what they think of Zizek, they will loyally tell you that he is a charlatan, and they will mean it. Another reason that Zizek is so often attacked by segments of the left is because he is a philosopher. And unlike Chomsky, he allows his philosophical ruminations and arguments to influence, if not always consistently direct, the political opinions he forms. Finally, Zizek is so often attacked because he prioritizes philosophy over politics. He is not as an historian, he's no longer a politician, but a thinker, a critical theorist. He talks about events in the world, except in rare circumstances, only as a part of an effort to elucidate his ideas. You know, the problem is that whenever I talk about politics, I feel it as if it's a fake. No, not in the sense that I'm faking, that I don't mean it, but my heart is not in it. The books that I really enjoyed writing was the one on Hegel, Ticklish, sorry, on Schelling, Ticklish subject, and so on. And that part of the message doesn't get through. So the profoundly non-speculative left, the left that thinks in terms of moral categories and that relies upon what Chomsky calls common sense, misinterprets and generally fails to seriously engage with Zizek. Further, both the continental and analytic left is, as Zizek would say, mired in ideology. We are all at the end of our ropes, confused, reactive, and impotent. However, that doesn't mean we should just give up. Rather, what it means is that we need to slow down and question our own arguments, our own critiques. In the case of Zizek, it means that we need to critique his critics not in order to vanquish them, but in a comradely fashion and in an effort to develop a more thorough and far-reaching critique of Zizek and his role in this moment of overall failure. Let's push aside everything that is worthless in Gabriel Rockhill's essay we can begin by isolating all the obvious fallacies. We'll start with how Rockhill cherry-picks his evidence. Rockhill attempts to smear Zizek through guilt by association. The Slovenian's appearance on the Foreign Policy Journal's list of the top 100 global thinkers in 2012 is presented as if it is both an endorsement of Zizek and as if it indicates Zizek's agreement with the political aims of the journal. But the list is not ideological. It isn't a list of who has the best ideas, but whose ideas are leading regardless of whether they fit with the journal's own politics. Other prominent thinkers listed on the top 100 global thinkers list includes Noam Chomsky, Umberto Eco, and Christopher Hitchens, along with figures such as Dick Cheney, Francis Fukuyama, and Benjamin Netanyahu. Worse than this attempt to smear Zizek by associating him with Samuel Huntington, who was a co-founder of the Journal of Foreign Policy, Rockhill claimed that Zizek regretted that the Red Army under Stalin defeated the Nazi war machine. And to prove this, he quotes from an interview 
on the BBC television program Hard Talk from November of 2009. However, when you watch the interview, it's clear that what Zizek is doing is making a very humble case for a return to Marx, or at least for a return to a critique of capitalism as it's understood in the West, namely as market-oriented liberal capitalism. And so on and so on. So let me make one... Do, do you feel you have the right to say that? I mean, after all, you're from Slovenia. Now, yeah. Slovenia wasn't surrounded by a wall, but it was part of Tito's Yugoslavia. It was communist, and it didn't have the freedoms that were seen in Western Europe. Oh. And do you think it's fair to say that the people of Slovenia, still more the people of East Germany or the Czech Republic or Slovakia, are not actually really enjoying the freedoms that they now have, that they certainly not, did not have before Wait a Let me make one point extremely clearly. I think that the communism of the 20th century, more specifically all the network of phenomena we refer to as Stalinism, are maybe the worst ideological, political, ethical, social and so on catastrophe in the history of humanity. And for me, it's a well, gen I, I find that hard to accept. I mean, you wrote I in, say in a recent... Well, you say it now, but you've written many different things. You wrote, for example, for example quote, better the worst Stalinist terror than the most liberal capitalist democracy. Uh, Those words taken from one of your books. Ah, but I... Okay, I will not go now. It will take half an hour to explain how... Uh, to explain how I mean this. I meant simply that uh, Stalinism... Not Stalinism. That the... the uh, uh, that uh, the communist regime starts started as a way of, through the revolution, of opening a space outside the existing capi capitalist ideology and so on and so on. But then, as I always emphasize, things went terribly, terribly wrong. My obsession almost with Stalinism is there is something so mysterious that went on there that we cannot yet really even explain it. Uh, fascism is much easier to account for in the terms of the crisis of capitalism than the fascist dream of alternate modernity. That is to say, you remain capitalist, but with an authoritarian structure and so, so, so on. So, so can we be clear then? In your view, was or was not communism a catastrophic failure? Total failure. By claiming that the rise and fall of Stalinism is more mysterious and a greater failure than Nazism, Zizek was not claiming that Nazism is preferable, but rather that the failure of fascism has no tragic component to it, whereas the failure of the Russian Revolution is both tragic and mysterious. The failure of the Russian Revolution beckons us back to it. We need to think it through again, Zizek suggested, because Fukuyama was wrong and history hadn't ended. Overall, the essay starts out with a series of bad faith arguments, and if it weren't for my acquaintance with Slovoy and my respect for his work, I would have put it aside after reading the first two paragraphs. However, there is an objection to Slovoy worth unpacking in this piece, namely this one. The accusation that Zizek is a pro-Western anti-communist dissonant is significant, especially at this moment when NATO is fighting a proxy war with Russia and appears to be on the verge of a conflict with China as well. The rational core of the argument against Zizek is difficult to discover, given that it's hidden under piles of insults, smears, and mischaracterizations, similar to the bad faith onslaught the piece begins with. However, it is discernible. The claim is that Zizek is a conservative, a reactionary, because during the era wherein Yugoslavia was titularly communist, he opposed the Communist Party and advocated for Slovenian independence. The accusation is important because it rests upon a few assumptions that, I believe, are fairly pervasive amongst the radical or Marxist left at the moment, and because these assumptions inform the small sections of the left who are rightly, in my estimation, objecting to the escalation of the war in Ukraine and the possible conflict with China. However, if we were to evaluate Zizek's opposition to the Communist Party of Yugoslavia and later to the Social Democrats in Slovenia, we should start by evaluating what's broadly known as really existing socialism and the slow dissolution of this form of socialism in the 20th century. To begin with, 
we should consider how Lenin, a figure whose name became, quite by accident and through failure, the most significant and important of all names amongst communists, conceived of socialism, so that we might judge the success or failure of the 20th century, of 20th century communism, by its own metric. Lenin, in October of 1917, and in a pamphlet entitled, Can the Bolsheviks Retain State Power?, wrote that Marx, basing himself on the experience of the Paris Commune, taught that the proletariat cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machine and use it for its own purposes, that the proletariat must smash this machine and substitute a new one for it. So, whether we're judging the success or failure of Yugoslavian socialism, the Soviet Union, or today's China, we have to ask to what extent the workers' revolution managed to smash the bourgeois state and substitute a new machine, a new mediating form of self-organization, for it. Or to put it another way, we must ask to what extent the Soviet Union, or China, or post-Tito Yugoslavia, was what Marx would sometimes call the dictatorship of the proletariat. This idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat is not simple. It isn't a merely nominal distinction, but rather, as Marx made clear in the Critique of the Gotha program, it can be distinguished from bourgeois republics or the various other forms of dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. To ask this question might strike some, perhaps Rockhill himself, as ultra-leftist, or put differently, we might be seen as demanding the impossible only as a part of an effort to fortify Western imperialism against the threat from Eastern communism. But what I want to suggest is that the competition between blocs and nations is itself evidence of the failure of 20th century revolution. If we are to judge the 20th century as against the critique of the Gothard program or by Lenin's own self-understanding, then we have to admit that by the time Yugoslavian communism arrived on the scene, and certainly by the era of the non-aligned movement and Titoism, the question of whether the revolution of 1917 had established a transitionary dictatorship of the proletariat that would be able to abolish a bourgeois feudal state and replace it with a new form that would unleash the power of the workers' ingenuity and industriousness had been answered negatively. For example, we might ask ourselves what caused the split between Tito and Stalin in 1948? Was it a matter of a contest of wills between two great men, each of whom was unwilling to follow the lead of the other? No, that's not what happened. As reported by Hal Draper in the publication Labor Action in 1949, Tito's Yugoslavia split with Moscow because Moscow had not delivered the materials Yugoslavia needed to develop its own industrial sector. Tito split with Stalin after he secured trade agreements with Britain. This demonstrates that while the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, China, and the rest could form independent political projects as nations, none could escape the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, or perhaps more accurately, of capital. The transition from capitalism to communism had not yet begun in 1948. <laughs> Sylvie Zizek, in his interview on Hard Talk, talks about how the left is unconsciously aligned with Fukuyama today. During the time of Tito's Yugoslavia, perhaps a similar observation was possible. Only instead of Fukuyama, one might have referred to Daniel Bell, who wrote The End of Ideology in the early 60s. At that time, the failure of 20th century socialism was already quite evident, and the need to overcome the impasse the failure represented, the necessity to create the revolution again and on a new foundation was expressed by C. Wright Mills rather than Slavoj Žižek. Mills, in his letter to a new left, observed that apathy and exhaustion with ideology, that is, with ideas that might lead to liberation, to radical changes, had taken hold in both the West and the East. Long before Margaret Thatcher, there was a truly bipartisan consensus that there was no alternative no alternative to welfare state, mixed economy capitalist management. After a trip to Russia, Wright reported that he'd kept writing notes to himself at the end of interviews with Soviet officials. Notes like, 
this man talks in a style just like Arthur Schlesinger Jr. And surely this fellow is a counterpart of Daniel Bell. Today we are living through a time when there is no alternative to what I'll call post-neoliberalism, a term that should be noted for its ambiguity. That is, today we have a clear political crisis raging, face tremendous instability in the international order, within the world culture, and within capitalism itself. And we are still clinging to Daniel Bell and Fukuyama. In his critique of Zizek, Rock Hill is quite clearly looking backwards and missing the moment. He ends his piece by hurling the term neoliberal prankster at Zizek, as he damns him for being able to sell books to a relatively mass audience in the West. But what we should note is that this move is precisely what allows him to avoid addressing Zizek politically in this moment. Here he chose to attempt character assassination rather than challenge Zizek's stance on Ukraine. He chose to pretend that it is surprising that intellectuals in post-Tito Yugoslavia would oppose their own state and seek independence, even if that meant accepting support from the West. He demands from Zizek an uncompromising allegiance to a project that can no longer be honestly understood as socialist, even as he ignores how Tito himself was too practical to be bogged down by such demands for misguided purity. Again, instead of debating Zizek about the escalation of the conflict in Ukraine, instead of meeting him in good faith in this moment, in an effort to create something new, in an effort to create a socialist project that might actually lead beyond capitalism, or even to a self-conscious attempt to create post-neoliberalism, Rockhill chose to continue on with the project of keeping the left exactly where it is, where it has been for decades to keep the left in the position of being useful idiots for either the Democratic Party in the West or for various political factions in the East. <laughs>